Before we dive into the heart of the program, I first want to take a moment to acknowledge that wherever we're gathering, we are on Indigenous land. And Mohai itself is on the historic and contemporary lands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and Coast Salish people. At Mohai, we acknowledge the forced displacement of Native communities from this land while honoring the endurance of the Duwamish people who still live here. To this day, the Duwamish have yet to receive federal recognition. And we encourage you to learn more about the Duwamish people and their struggle for federal recognition, as well as all the wonderful work they do at the Longhouse. So please take some time to um, think about that. We also want to note that this program is taking place at the same time as unprecedented protests against police violence in our community, especially towards Black people. These protests and in our community and across the nation are a call to action for each of us to state unequivocally that Black lives matter. And Mohai stands unfalteringly with those who are calling for justice now. And tonight we're going to be learning more about the power of activism, about the power of fighting for justice and about the power of community and um, culture and coming together to build something. Um, but I will leave that to our wonderful panelists. And with that, I would like to introduce our fabulous moderator. We're so glad to have Enrique Serna. Enrique Serna is a veteran journalist with more than four decades of experience. He's been honored with nine regional Emmy Awards and numerous other journalistic honors. And in March, he was appointed by Governor Jay Inslee to the Washington State University Board of Regents. Thank you so much, Enrique, for being here with us. And I will turn it over to you to introduce our panelists. All right. Thank you very much, Rachel. And go Cougs, although Roberto Maestas would say go dogs. I know that. He and I had an ongoing uh, battle over the, uh, he, he was a obviously University of Washington uh, graduate and I went to WSU, but uh, he was a, quite a friend of mine. And of course, we're going to talk about the legacy he left behind as well as the institution that he helped found and that was El Centro de la Raza. But first, um, let's get started by introducing uh, the folks that are joining us tonight. And I also want you to know that I'm very excited about being able to do this because El Centro is a, very special place in my heart and uh, because of Roberto and Estella and all the folks that have been there for so many years. Also want to mention that October 12th, which uh, was last week, I believe, or it's the Centro celebrated its 48th anniversary. So uh, who would have thought that uh, back in the day when El Centro was uh, just this uh, object of Beacon Hill School and people decided to take it over to uh, start this place for the people of all races would uh, last that long. Well, tonight we're going to look at its history and the past, but we're also gonna look forward to the future. But let me um, get to our panel. I'm very pleased that they are joining us this evening. Uh, our uh, first guest is a gentleman by the name of Bruce E. Johansson. He uh, is a professor of communication and Native American studies. Uh, Bruce uh, taught, researched, and wrote at the University of Nebraska at Omaha from 1982 to 2019, retiring to emeritus status as the Frederick, Frederick W. Kaiser Research Professor, and he's published 50 books in several fields, including history, anthropology, law, and earth sciences, and he's published this book, which is called Seattle's El Centro de la Raza, Dr. King's Living Laboratory, that we're going to celebrate this evening. Also, uh, and Bruce, uh, thank you for joining us, and I uh, hope you pop on there so we can see you. And also with us this evening is Estela Ortega. Estela is the executive director and co-founder of El Centro de la Raza. Estela has dedicated her entire professional career to building El Centro de la Raza and the beloved community. Since its founding, she works tirelessly serving and advocating for low-income families and communities of color. And welcome, Estela. Good to have you here. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Enrique. All Thank right. You so much. Larry Gossett. Larry Gossett is a University of Washington graduate. He was the founder of the University of Washington's Black Student Union and, the founding and a founding member of Seattle's Black Panther Party. Uh, in 1972, he joined Roberto Maestas and 124 other activists in occupying the Beacon Hill School and declaring it El Centro de la Raza, the Center for People of All Races. He served eight terms on the King County Council. He's a Seattle icon and an icon here at Martin Luther 
King County. And I know he would love to hear, have other people make sure that they uh, acknowledge that. Uh, a community activist also joining us for uh, this evening, a community activist for more than 40 years, Sharon Tomiko Santos was elected to the Washington State House of Representatives. Uh, representing the 37th district. She was elected in 1998. She's been uh, holding that position since. Representative Santos chairs the House Education Committee and serves on the House Capital Budget Committee and Consumer Protection and Business Committee, along a list of communities there. Her legislative proposals reflect her strong advocacy for closing the opportunity gap. And uh, welcome, Representative Santos. Good to have you with us. Thank you. And the guy who has a great name, uh, Enrique Gonzalez, is with us this evening. He's a community engagement specialist at the Seattle Office of Police Accountability and began focusing on police accountability while working at El Centro de la Raza. His family was part of the 1972 occupation of El Centro and from which uh, Enrique attributes much of his social justice training. And also with us is Yakima tribal member, uh, Dr. Mike Tooley. He grew up on multiple Indian reservations, but has been in Seattle for the past 34 years. Mike has worn many professional hats and is currently the executive director of United Indians of All Tribes Foundation. And of course, its uh, founder was a guy named Bernie Whitefair, one of the white bear, one of the uh, gang of four of which uh, Roberto Maestas and Larry Gossett and Bob Santos were all a part. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, Estella, let me begin with you. In that, you know, I noted that uh, it's been 48 years since uh, uh, El Centro came to be. Uh, would you have imagined that uh, 48 years later that it would be the institution that it is now? Because it really is an institution in this community. But, you know, when, when you look back on history, we didn't imagine what we would turn into, but I certainly think that people had a vision that we were going to build an organization that was going to be benefiting the Latino community and people of all races. And so there was that vision that we would be here for the long term, uh, but certainly didn't know what it would mean. And of course, we believe that with all the help of so many volunteers and community people um, helping build El Centro de la Raza, that it is, it is become um, what Roberto would refer to as an oasis of hope. That's what he wanted in a beloved mm -hmm. community. Larry Gossett, um, you were part of that takeover way back when. Um, tell me a little bit about that. <coughs> and uh, that day being there, and uh, what it was like, the atmosphere. All right, thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to start by mentioning the, the name of Roberto Maestas, uh, our, the leader of El Centro and the leader of the uh, takeover of El Centro on the uh, afternoon of October 11th, 1972. And the reason that Roberto and the other uh, founders uh, of El Centro de la Raza, most of whom were ESL students that were tired of being sent from one portable to another to a meeting locale that happened to be either inside or outside sometime. They said, we need a, a home uh, that we can call our own for our uh, people and other dispossessed people. So that led to the takeover. The reason was, uh, decided to do it on that day. It's, it's the day before Columbus Day. And Roberto was always a character, always humorous. The students that, that he was the ESL uh, teacher of uh, really loved him because of his humor, his politics and his leadership. And he said, we wanna be in there when the police come the next morning on October 12th so that we can tell them that we discovered El Centro de la Raza, just like Columbus <laughs> did on this day in 1492. And we're going to define it as a center for all the people. Hence, uh, the reason why he said we're going to call this El Centro de la Raza, the center of all the people. The second last thing I want to say real quickly is that from the beginning, it was multi-ethnic, multi-racial, uh, purposely so, because he, his students, 
and a lot of other uh, Latinx uh, activists in the greater Seattle area uh, had already started working closely with the Natives American, Native American activists, African American activists, and activists under the leadership of uh, Sharon's husband, uh, the late great uh, Bob Santos in the International Ch District Chinatown. So he had gotten used to working with all of us. He asked us to join him. We had 124 people, about 12 or 14 were Asian, about 15 people were African Americans, uh, about uh, eight, 60 or 70 were uh, Latinos, and there were eight to 10 uh, Indios uh, and several Asians there, as well as a few uh, progressive whites. So from the beginning, El Centro's, from its birth to today, it's been a multi-ethnic oasis, if I can borrow a word from Chata, uh, that exists in this community. I look forward to participating and talking about it more as we move on down the road. Thank you. Right. Uh, Bruce Johansson, let me uh, uh, reach out to you. And that is that uh, in the book, uh, you note that this was, uh, it's called Dr. King's Living Laboratory. That's kind of the subtitle of your book, and, and which really that idea of a beloved community and this, it being multicultural was, it, that's really what El Centro has been about in its time. Tell me a bit as you uh, decided to write this book, or I guess there were more than just you deciding it. What, what was, what was, was that the main thing you found and you wanted to make sure that people understood? Well, it is, and well, first I'd like to thank us, us, Della and Miguel Ballestas, who put in hours and hours and hours to get the book into form. Um, now the book um, Roberto and I have first, you know, the, the idea first came up in 1984 and you, you mentioned my start date in um, Omaha is 1982. Well, before in 1982, I was in Seattle and I, I worked at, you know, El Centro, you know, on and off. Um, it, it's, uh, kind of hard to sum up. I mean, it's a long time and a long time ago. Um, but I think that El Centro speaking personally <coughs> helped to make me a thinking, feeling uh, person. And um, I think that's important in light of you know, Dr. King's uh, thinking. And this evening, as I watched Barack Obama speak, I was thinking of Dr. King. And I, th I thought it's so, Tice and, you know, it's so great to hear a person who's dignified and decent speaking as an important politician, you know, and figure um, in light of what we've had for the past four years. Um, I mean, every day I get up and ask myself, well, who is he going to you know, abuse today? Um, 
or tomorrow and how many times that he's so rotten and 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 all my f- friends from you know India and Australia and and you know all over the world in the EU pale and all and Zoom are asking me what's happened to your country. I mean, they. Well, we're trying to find a little love, I think, more than anything yeah. else. Oh, uh, yeah. And some well, other me, thing. Bruce, I'm going to move over to Estella just for a quick second here. And, and that is in, the, in this book, um, because it really focuses on kind of, again, the beloved community. When, when you go up to El Centro today and you see the, the Plaza Roberta Maestas, there's that, there's this beautiful sign and all the murals. And um, that is what. Is that the heart of what this organization is all about? Absolutely. And, you know, as Larry said, from the very beginning, multiracial unity was intentional um, and that we knew that that's how you built community. And when you brought people together, that you were going to be stronger. So in the last 40, 48 years, El Centro de la Raza is always looking at ways is how do we, whatever we're doing, whether it's Dia de los Muertos, whether it was the, you know, the construction of Plaza Maestas and all the beautiful art that is depicted throughout the building, that we knew, we knew that it had to be multiracial so that people would be, would feel welcomed to El Centro through Plaza Maestas. When we um, had, when we changed Dia de los Muertos to make it more inclusive of all people, we knew that that was going to build unity amongst people. We were going to have a greater understanding. Relationships were going to to be built, and then when we do things together in struggle, we're going to win. We're going to become stronger as as a community. Sharon Miko Santos, um, you grew up on um, Beacon Hill and where uh, El Centro was situated. So you know, you, do you probably remember it as Beacon Hill School? Did you go to that school? No, I did not. <laughs> you did not, okay. I'm it was just closed curious. before. Okay, but uh, you know, the community, um, you know, what, what is interesting to me is that that area, uh, there it's a lot of com- Asians that live in, the, in that particular area, mm-hmm. but it is so mixed really. And, and El Centro has become this focal point of a district that you represent, as far as uh, where people look to it for for assistance, uh, for opportunity, uh, for help, uh, it has become that that very important place in the community to turn to. Absolutely, you know, El Centro de la Raza has uh, is is that center. It's that center for all people, and. Um, you know, uh, as you noted, Enrique, I, I grew up just a few blocks away, um, and it was uh, an old, um, uh, abandoned, really, um, Seattle public school. Uh, there had been a growth in the Seattle public schools at that period of time, and so they were at, they actually took that population of students that were had previously attended uh, Beacon Hill School, and they split it into two elementary schools, both serving that neighborhood. Um, I think what's very interesting is that today, the current Beacon Hill School, one of the things that is well known uh, for is that it is the Beacon Hill uh, International School. And that too is part of the story of that North Beacon Hill area that um, the communities that have been displaced from other areas uh, found uh, that they were moving um, to other places like Beacon Hill, like the Central District. You know, before then, we were all segregated as a community into this narrow area called the sort of the International District, which is part of the history of why it's called the International District, right? Uh, it's not just Chinatown, it's not just Japantown, it is the International District. Um, that uh, my my husband um, was raised in and loved uh, greatly. Um, but to me, as I was growing up and watching uh, the activity that surrounded uh, El Centro de la Raza, what, um, what I felt and what I sensed as a young person, as a child really, is that gravitational pull of welcome, of belonging, 
of uh, respect uh, for the people uh, who lived in um, the North Beacon Hill area, regardless of uh, their ancestry, their race, their, their culture, and their customs. Um, and I think that is still a distinguishing characteristic of uh, Beacon Hill, largely because we have an institution that is known as El Centro de la Raza that has uh, become uh, that, uh, if you will, that um, touchstone of that spirit of welcome, of safety, of um, service. And um, I, I do have to say, uh, sort of as I'm thinking about El Centro, I'm, I am always filled with a warm spot when I think of El Centro and not only how it was when I was a little girl, it was just this old building. And you, I, I remember thinking, you know, you, you actually have people who are working there uh, on a regular basis. And it, it was very difficult because I'm, I'm sure it was cold and drafty. I mean, it was abandoned, right? Um, and uh, to see it today is such a marvelous example of, I always say it is uh, one of the only two examples that I know of in the state of Washington of culturally responsive transit-oriented development. And very that's true. very important because people need to know without that culturally responsive and community responsive uh, uh, component, um, transit-oriented development otherwise tends to do what development does, which is it displaces people. And uh, we actually through El Centro de la Raza have the exact opposite impact. It is centering people and it is centering not only the beloved community of uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but I honestly believe that Roberto's spirit lives there. It <laughs> lives there in the walls, it lives there in the air um, and uh, he has that spirit of love and welcome. Uh, and that's why, that's why it's such a compelling place to be. Yeah. Enrique Gonzalez, um, your parents were a part of the uh, takeover way back when. And, but you literally grew up at El Centro. Tell me about that. I, I did. Um, before I, I tell you about that, I think it's relevant to say, as Roberto might say, Para los niños trabajamos, porque los niños son los que saben amar, porque los niños son la esperanza del mundo. It is for the children that we work, for they are the ones who know how to love, for they are the hope of the world. I grew up um, going to the Jose Marti Child Development Center, which um, has become one of the premier child development centers in the state. Um, and I really think that, you know, I can't remember a time when I didn't have a social justice part of my life. Um, and, I, and I imagine how difficult it must be for young people these days, seeing so much injustice go on, but at the same time, be inspired by young people in the streets and young people protesting many of the things that are going on today. I imagine what it must have been like in 1972 for some of you all to step into a building as young people and say, uh, you know, this is our moment. This is what we have to do because it's the right thing to do. At that time, I think they wanted to arrest you all. And, and now, you know, you all are states people, you know, that, you know, are highly revered and, and looked upon as people that are inspiring. And I just imagine like, who are the folks in 30 years that are getting arrested right now that we're going to be celebrating for their courage. So I, you know, growing up at El Centro, I really felt like um, there, was, there was always something that we had to be doing that was related to social justice. It was just a way of life and it, and it has continued to be that. And while I, I grew up, you know, going to school there and then I work there, El Centro is still a part of my life simply because it is my belief through all of that work that there's a difference between your job and your work. Your job will change from time to time, but your work doesn't. And I think that we were told early in our lives, those of us that went to school there, that our work and our service had to be 
for the people and it had to be for social justice. And so we are always trying to find new ways to do that. Um, and I, I'm always honored and, and glad to be in the presence of people who have been doing it for so long because I still have much to learn. Uh, Mike Tooley, um, you know, Bernie White Bear was uh, part of the Gang of Four, part of, uh, you know, he was a good friend with Larry and Bob and, of, of course, Roberto. Uh, but El Centro itself, what has it meant, really, when you look at, uh, as a nonprofit, which uh, United Indians is, but what does it mean to your organization and how do you guys work together? I've always uh, just had a very special place in my heart for El Centro. Uh, Estelle has done a, just a fabulous job of really uh, making uh, the system go. Uh, Roberto built it up, but Estelle certainly has uh, uh, gained the baton and just really has made a real go of it. I know quite often I am always kind of studying how Estelle uh, has uh, her operations going all the time, very dynamic, always things happening over there. I notice every time I go over there, there's always a lot of functions over there, a lot of different groups utilizing her, uh, the uh, El Centro de la Rosa Plaza, just was just amazing how much uh, activity she has over there. And I just really feel that's something that I uh, have always wanted to kind of uh, emulate and we still do. I'm just really proud of knowing Estelle and Anne Roberto uh, you know, a really funny little story about Roberto is uh, uh, we used to call him, our Indian name for him was Automatic. And the reason why we called him that is because, uh, I don't know if you guys knew this, but he was actually a pretty good ball player back in his day. He used to wear this red bandana and, uh, you know, we had a hard time stopping him. You know, he was only like about 5'6 or 5'7, but he was really fast and sinewy and strong. And, uh, you know, all, you know we, we, we just couldn't seem to keep up with that guy. And, uh, you know, just uh, really good memories of that guy. He'd come over to Indian Heritage and he said, Mike, can we use the gym? Yeah, sure. And, uh, boy, he would just really uh, run, run the gamut on us. We just had a great time with him. But, you know, this is just part of the memory I know of him. I, I read the book and I just really uh, just see that there's just so many wonderful things that uh, has been happening over the years. A lot of the, uh, you know, struggles that Roberto overcame, a lot of the establishments that he's made happen. You know, even as a young boy, I, just judging from the book, he was a leader even as young as 15, you know, helping the, you know, the agricultural workers doing interpretations and translations and just really made a difference, kind of led him on his path to uh, what he was able to do for the uh, Latinx uh, community, you know, through the, uh, throughout the 70s and the 80s and 90s. And of course, just leading up to today. And again, I just want to reiterate, it's just a I just very have a high regard for Estella and what she's done, her and Roberto. I played basketball against Roberto. I mean, he and uh, he, he challenged, he could challenge Gary Payton when it came to trash talking. Um, yeah, yeah. And he occasionally backed it up. I wouldn't give him that much credit. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> he was always fun to play with. Um, Bruce, I, I'm writing this book. Um, what, what did you find that really made El Centro a unique story? Um, well, it started out in the early, early 70s. Um, and I, I first met Roberto uh, um, and Larry, you know, up at the U under some in us, which what's the word, you know, in us on suspicious uh, stances. And the whole stories in the book, uh, well, I won't go over it, but it's all in the book. It takes the whole time. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I mean, we, we you know, and, and, and after those inauspicious circumstances, things become, became auspicious in a hurry. Um, and I, I got to know all of the things that we've been talking about. Um, in the meantime, I went to 
fork at the you know the 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 times and Roberto and I kept in contact and I still have a hard time referring to him in the past tense um, you know all of us were f f friends of his, but anyway, he calls me up and he, this is a 72 in the fall. And he calls me up at the times and he says, something really big is going to happen on Beacon Hill in October. So keep your eyes and ears open. <laughs> Well, so let me ask you then, and Larry, you can weigh in on this as well. I, I'm going to interrupt you there for, for a second there, Bruce. But um, were you, were you, what was the planning as far as the takeover was concerned? Um, it, it was planned uh, carefully, you know, and um, all of this is, you know, in the, the book. Yeah. Too, but um, it well, was... let me ask Larry. Larry, what was the planning? And Stella, you well, jumped in on it too. Who, yeah. who, how, how did that come I, about? Yeah. Um, the reason I knew a little something about the planning is because I had met Roberto back on the evening of March 29th, uh, 1968, uh, when we had Oregon, the Black Student Union had organized a sit in at Franklin High School. And at that time, Roberto was a Spanish teacher there. And when the black students, some black women have been kicked out for wearing their hair uh, natural, the principal said, you don't look ladylike, so you gotta go home. Here they are becoming their natural black selves and he gonna send them home to straighten their hair. And he kicked out two black a young men, one of whom was the president of the Black Student Union on that same day. So uh, the black students said enough is enough. So he took over school. Roberto was the only faculty member uh, that was unafraid and stayed there. And uh, to show you the impact that that sit-in had on his life, the very next morning when he got to Franklin High School, he went into the teacher's office and said, hey, y'all listen up. There's about 11 teachers in there. From this day forward, I will no longer respond to Bob. I will no longer respond to Robert. My name is Roberto. And from that day to the time he died, that, that, that was uh, the truth. But in 1972, a large number, a growing number of Latino people were moving into Seattle. Uh, they needed services badly, particularly the language ones that I spoke of earlier. And nobody was responsive. So institutionalized racism and unaccountable social uh, responsiveness from the government uh, in the schools uh, was the reason why uh, Roberto and all the rest of us who supported him said, enough is enough. We got to find a, a center that all the people can use to get uh, to deal with the issues related to racism and economic exploitation that was going on against minorities here in Seattle. And that was the background. And I already told you, Roberto chose October 11th because we wanted to be there. Yeah, on yeah. so-called uh, Columbus Day that we call Indigenous People's Day today. So you can, people can get the sense that this institution grew out of the people's struggle for social change, for empowerment, for living decent lives, particularly making it better for our children. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it grew out of <laughs> protest. It grew out of, dem it really, yeah. democracy is what it yeah. grew out of. It, it, Fight it was, for democracy. Yeah, Estella. So if I could, could add, Enrique, that I think is extremely important to point out around the occupation is, is the English as a second language students who had their consciousness raised over a couple of year period um, in that Roberto, we always say he, he was a high school teacher at, as mentioned. And so he felt that the students and learning English should go and go out and practice their English. And practicing that English meant going to the Indian reservation and helping defend 
um, Native Americans' rights to fish in their usual and accustomed places and build relationships. The same thing with the African American community in terms of, of helping shut down construction sites that um, the unions at the time weren't responding to um, th those good jobs um, that should also be going to the African American community. And then of course, the gentrification that was beginning to happen within um, the, um, in the international district. So important there is that when that particular ESL program was cut, is that people had a consciousness about their power and what that they were capable of doing and it required courage. And when the idea came up to occupy a building, it was those ESL students that were the impetus and that was the example to others in the community, others at the University of Washington um, that were inspired by those students um, and supported them. And, and therein lies the story of El Centro de la Raza and that multiracial unity. You know, through the years, how did El Centro build its reputation? I mean, you, you have this takeover, you have to establish yourself, probably constant uh, fundraising efforts to, for what you want to, uh, to do to be able to provide services. Uh, but I think, you know, when I first came to town as a reporter, uh, I can remember Roberto and Bob and Larry and you know, always being at it every protest seems like, you know, and I remember the reporters sort of kind of making fun of that. But the fact was, is that there was a consistency there. Now, how did El Centro then build itself into becoming something that the community had to recognize that, hey, these folks have a bit of power with the people? Yeah, I mean, if, if you think about our history, the first seven years, um, everyone that participated, whether they were volunteers who would come and go, or people who were there day in and day out, we worked as volunteers. And people were committed to creating a community, and they knew that it took time and sacrifice and day in and day out work. And um, and so whatever we took on, you know, whether it was making ensuring that we were gonna provide services to community, we did it. Um, when we said that we were gonna support a struggle, you could count on El Centro de la Raza being there. And so it was the consistency, the commitment, and keeping our word on um, what we were, whatever we were going to do. And the establishment saw that. I mean, after seven years, we were still there because people expected us to self-destruct. Um, in fact, there's stories about that the powers that be expected that to happen. And if it didn't happen, is that they would create the conditions uh, for us to, for division to be there. Um, and so Roberto was very wise to that and knew what had happened to, um, you know, the Black Panther Party, knew what, ha what had happened to, um, Dr. King's movement and so forth. And so we learned lessons from that. We studied the movements that were happening um, in our country and also throughout um, the liberation struggles of Latin America, Africa, and Asia. So, you know, with all that being said, it's just that there was a commitment um, to multiracial unity. There was a commitment to um, to social justice, to take on the powers that be, because we needed to do that for our community so that our people could live dignified lives and be respected. And that's what carried us on and still carries us on to this day. I think that, uh, wasn't Roberto on an FBI list <laughs> at one point? And uh, yes. I don't know about Bob and Larry. Larry, were you ever I, on I, I was. When I was reading, when I was reading uh, about what Bruce Johansson said, uh, was the information he got from looking at Roberto's uh, FBI file. Uh, it was very similar in many ways to what I was able to read when through the organized efforts of the committee to end government spying in 1977, I was able to uh, become the first activist to get his FBI and Seattle police files back. And a lot of it, that's fine, was just ridiculous. Uh, but yeah, I, I, 
Yeah, a lot of us know about it. Uh, uh, one, I guess I'd you like can't to get take one, it as a badge of honor right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But one quick example on showing, and when you, when, when, uh, and, 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 uh, Enrique and Bruce and Estella have mentioned it, but when the Latino people from else from from English as a second language, this is 1969, 70, and 71, would come to demonstrations organized by Tyree Scott and Todd Hawkins and other black construction workers. The black construction workers were so impressed. Here come 18, 20, sometimes 22 or 23 Mexicans speaking Spanish. Most of the black workers, unemployed black workers had no idea about you know, they had a hard time in those language arts classes in English, but they said, what are they talking about, Larry? Uh, are they talking about supporting y'all, you know, man? Because I didn't know that much Spanish myself, so I said they're here to support us. They were so amazed. They said, all these Mexicans going on sites with us, and they're not even going to be the beneficiaries of the jobs. And then they start going to jail with us. And that happened several times that at CIU, at the airport, at, at uh, Harborview, when we closed down those construction sites, uh, 15, 20 Latinos went, and they were still uh, just learning English. It had a profound impact. So when Roberto uh, and the other activists at El Centro de la Raza said uh, that we need some of y'all to come with us uh, on the evening of, of uh, October 11th, I think about eight of the 15 or 20 blacks were uh, construction workers. They had no problem. They said they were there for us. One speaking no English, but they were down for the people. We're going to be there for them. And that's the meaningfulness uh, of what El Centro has been over all the years since its birth in 72. Right. You know, Enrique, um, I want to jump in here real quick. Sure. Because I think one of the things that um, uh, is easy to just kind of brush by, but I do think it's so critical to acknowledge uh, that the movement um, that we're talking about of the late 60s and the early 70s uh, was not just about um, an ideological response. It was not just about um, sort of a, a, a movement based on just feeling, even though obviously um, for all of us, uh, our, our feelings about Roberto and how he epitomizes the spirit of El Centro de la, de la Raza. But what's very important, I think, to honor and remember is that from the very beginning to today, uh, the El Centro de la Raza movement is based on intellectual research and understanding of what people are doing, why they are doing it, and what you are moving towards. Um, it is uh, the fact that when we talk about the beloved community, it is not just based on these warm, fuzzy feelings. It is based on an intellectual grasp of the teachings of the Reverend Dr. King and uh, an analysis, an intellectual analysis and it's, it's very similar to, um, uh, I think, what is often overlooked about the Black Panthers, is that the work of the Black Panthers was not just radical, you know, um, uh, Black power. It was about Black power that was based on an intellectual uh, grappling of why are we engaged in um, this political activism and what are we moving towards? And... Uh, the, the towards in the case of uh, Roberto and all of the other uh, Latinx um, activists was creating the space that they didn't otherwise have for the promotion of the community. And I think it's so very important to honor, respect, and remember that intellectual basis. Enrique Gonzalez, um, your parents came from Mexico, right? When they first came... Did they come here directly from Mexico from uh, to Seattle? Uh, eventually they landed here. My, it was my, my grandmother who brought her children and my father was 12 years old. Um, and by age 16 is when the occupation was taking place. And so my grandmother was actually one of Roberto's ESL students who was receiving a lot of that social justice. Oh, yeah.
that we're talking about. And so, um, you know, obviously my father who ended up becoming very involved in the labor movement um, has used a lot of the same training in, in a lot of the organizing that he's done. And so um, much, much like what um, Sharon is talking about, um, this, this is, it's definitely not something that we just kind of, you know, we all have good feelings about Roberto and, and have good memories, but it's also something that we use on a daily basis. Um, you know, I, I, I work in police accountability and I can't tell you how much the training and the understanding of how social justice works is necessary to be able to do some of the jobs that we have right now. And so um, it's also very important for the current young people that are, that are breaking out and trying to create some of that new space. Um, and so it, it is absolutely something that is not just something that we feel, it's a, it's, a, it's a way of life. Well, you bring up a good point here that let me transition to a question that was just posted here uh, from uh, one of our uh, viewers this evening. Uh, and this uh, was a question for you, or you could answer it, Enrique, or anybody else. But it says, uh, Enrique, do you wondered about the young people today who will be tomorrow's adult voices for justice? Are there mentoring opportunities, or is it better to let them rise organically? Uh, Enrique, you wrote so organically. I don't think there's any question about that. But That's, uh, weigh in on that. Yeah, the, I mean, I think it 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 has been an organic um, maturity and growth, and it's still happening. But I also think that there's absolutely the need for mentorship. Um, many of the folks on this on this panel have people who are their mentoring and who they're bringing up. Um, and but, but I think in terms of the organic aspect of it. Um, you know, it, I, I think that there is a big need to let young people drive the car a little bit. Um, there, there is so much energy and so much enthusiasm with some of the folks who are pushing things right now. Um, you know, I, I, there's even some, some younger folks who I'm whispering to um, and, and saying, you know, this is what I would do and so on. But, you know, it, it really requires that we the, the, the level of support that is necessary, you know, many of the lessons that have been learned even by folks on this panel need to be need to be captured. I see Larry doing it all the time with our new council member, you know, so, you know, that type of dynamic relationship that we have with elders, but with young people is something that indigenous communities have cherished for, for centuries, right. you know, that's just the way of life. And so, um, it's something that I know that young people are looking to folks who have come before for guidance, but they're also looking to um, be supported in their enthusiasm and, and, and have that spirit of resistance show in the streets as much as possible. Mike Tully, um, how do you use the mentoring and particularly uh, the legacy of Bernie White Bear? Well, one thing I, you know, I can state is that I have kind of, kind of been learning over the years about how uh, Larry, Roberto, and Bob, and Bernie, how they got things done. And I, I see that kind of happening today, even in the uh, in the way that we all go down to uh, Olympia. We, we always try to do things as a group to try to gain resources, because it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's even though the economy was somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat stable until COVID-19 hit, it was always kind of a struggle to uh, gain uh, what we would consider uh, appropriate funding for all the work that we're trying to do. So I think just studying that kind of like how that was, uh, you know, kind of devised over the years from the early 70s, uh, you know, I guess stemming from uh, those guys is always gathering down in international districts and uh, singing karaoke and, uh, you know, always kind of uh, making their plans and uh, having their gatherings, the, uh, you know, the uh, multicultural gatherings. It was just, uh, you know, although there's a lot of fun items that was, uh, provided for the community, you know, there was still a lot of business that got done. And those are the kind of things that I always kind of, uh, kind of look, to, look to to see how, you know, that we can kind of make those things uh, uh, kind of continue. So ensuring that there's a, uh, you know, we're, we're gaining uh, proper resources for all our uh, upcoming, uh, you know, youth. You know, as, as far as Bernie goes, he was a very, uh, he was very active. You know, he was, uh, he was a jokester. I uh, love to uh, sing Elvis Presley songs, and, uh, <laughs> and that was really, but, he, you know, but all kidding aside, he was just the type of person who just loved to make things happen with uh, Roberto, Larry, and Bob. It was just a, just a very unbreakable bond that, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, I, I start, I see it somewhat in our community today. I, you know, I converse quite a bit with the other 
ethnic groups, and there's a lot, a lot of uh, pretty, solid, pretty solid connection there. And I, uh, you know, I think uh, we owe a lot of it to, uh, uh, you know, kind of the footprints that uh, Larry and them have left for us. And I think that's really a, a, a component that I think we should be a playbook for us to utilize even to the, the future generations. It's kind of how I see it. Uh, yeah, I picked up a few stories by going to Bush Garden and meeting, meeting Uncle Bob there a few times. So, yeah. Um, Bruce, uh, what do you think young people can learn from this book? Um, well, the, you know, the book was uh, started, you know, and, you know, I, I dug out a, a letter between Berto and I, you know, I, I mean, I was in Omaha by then, and we, we wrote, you know, back and forth often. Um, he wanted to start a book, and then things kept postponing it because there was other stuff that was, you know, more urgent in the the present tense, but the idea was to preserve something of the, you know, the, the descriptive history of the institution, but also the feeling of it and the ideology behind it, because we were all getting up in age and we wanted to have a, a record of it. You know, right. people, they're, they're all kinds of things that, you know, you can get if you come to El Centro and meet folks and just, you know, look at the, you know, art on the Walls, but um, we we wanted to have this for the future uh, future generations, so yeah. that they could hold on to it too. Yeah. Stella, yeah. weigh yeah. in on that. Uh, what what do you think that they can young people can take from this book? Oh, just uh, we, go ahead. We can't. We're having trouble hearing you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Just to let, um, first of all, to let people know, is the book is being promoted um, to colleges and universities and libraries across the country that young people are going to know. And what they're going to learn, which I think is so important, is obviously, um, you know, all the, the unity is built in terms of working together and learning about the struggles of not only people say within your region, but in the nation and in the world, um, that that we're not alone, you know, in in our our struggle to build a better world. And I want to give one concrete uh, example. I know that Barbara Mendoza is uh, listening in, and I just want to tell a quick story about the influence that the Chilean community um, had on El Centro de la Raza. Uh, when, um, you know, the United States was involved in, in overthrowing um, the, gover the government of Salvador Allende is that then many people uh, obviously left the country and a number of Chilean families, as Roberto would say, landed at El Centro de la Raza. And the people that landed at El Centro were people who were part of the government of Salvador Allende, who led, um, you know, the political parties within their country. And so they had, um, they offered a lot to El Centro. And El Centro was just starting and, and we had a commitment in terms of building community, but we really weren't quite sure how to do that. And the Chilean community helped us begin to identify you know, who we are, what did we believe in, what, what do we stand for? And out of those kind of questions, we developed 12 principles that we live and work by, you know, that deal with, um, you know, supporting the struggles of, of, 
of other people, supporting workers, multiracial unity, that we have to work to save our planet. Um, and so through the help of the Chilenos, we grew in the infrastructure of El Centro developed. And so I just want to acknowledge that because Barabas is here listening, but it's so important for young people to know that we, we need to look to other struggles to learn because we are a, you know, an international movement for building um, a stronger world. There's a question that came up here and <clears throat> Larry, perhaps you can uh, take this on. Uh, person is asking that they, they would like to hear more from Larry about the Gang of Four, where that nickname came from. How was it embraced by all of you guys? Um, and I'm wondering if you see the squad of women in Congress today as inheritors at the national level uh -huh. of the Gang of Four's multi-ethnic progressive activism. Um, I guess the one thing, you know, you and I have talked about, Larry, and that is, uh, you know, taking the, the, the unity that you guys had and how, how those young people today that are activists can apply it. Anyway, can you uh, address that a little bit, Larry? Yeah. Gang of but Four. I, I, so I want to take a real quick second just to show people the cover of the book on the Four uh, Amigos. It says, four leaders, four communities, and one friendship. And I think that the fact that we all got together in the context of struggle, I met Roberto when we were having a sit-in. I met uh, Bernie uh, White Bear uh, when he, at Frank's Landing when we went out there to support Indian fishing rights and Roberto asked a lot of black activists to go out there with him. Uh, and I went out there on a boat my first day out there and nobody asked me could I swim, but I knew I thought that's what we supposed to do. <laughs> but I couldn't swim; they really got on me. Uh, but I went out on the water to protect the Indian rights of fish. Uh, and then, because I met Bernie there, he invited us uh, in the uh, uh, spring of 1970 to join them when they took over uh, Fort Lawton land that had been promised them, and uh, uh, you know, in the 18. Uh, 50s uh, in treaties, and they said we're going to get the land back. And about 14 um, black youth, half of us Black Panthers, the other half Black Student Union leaders, climbed over the fence in our slacks. And the Native American kids said, "Why are they so sharp? Look at look those shoes they got on." And Bernie had been in the service, so he real quickly said, "Oh, oh don't worry about that. Black people always got to be cool." And then he turned around and started doing his rendition of a ghetto gayet, and it just caused everybody to explode in laughter. But it caused the Native American youth and young adults that were there to really get along with us. And we stayed out there about three or four uh, days. And then lastly, when all of our groups, the United Construction Workers Association, the Black Student Union, El Centro de la Raza, uh, workers group, the Black Panther Party, didn't have anywhere to uh, meet and from 1968 to 70. We called on Bob Santos because at that time he was the exec director of Caritas House. And it's an old school. I, I don't know if it used to be macro school, but there's a lot of meeting places in there. And he let us meet to talk about how to build power amongst people, Black people and other people of color. And that's how the four of us got together. And we developed a friendship. I think that uh, at El Gato Loco, Chata will have to tell y'all what that means. Uh, it, it was a bar slash restaurant, I guess. Uh, but they used to start calling me Rich Boy and I couldn't, I was getting mad. But they pointed out to me that Larry, you was raised in the housing, you came from the housing projects of High Point. So you got more wealth than the rest of it. I said, what are y'all talking about? Project boys are poor. And, and Bernie said, yeah, but I lived in a teepee until I was about 10 or 11 years old over in the Colville Reservation. Bob Santos said I lived in a little room, nine by 13, with the bathroom down the hall uh, when I was a zero to 11. And Robert said, what y'all talking about? I'm the youngest of 17 kids in a little three room built a house uh, I'm out in Los, outside of Las Vegas. New Mexico, and that's where I was 
raised. So I had to shut up because all of them showed that they were, uh, that's my wife, Rhonda. Yep. Uh, uh, the, all, all of them showed how they objectively were poured in me and coming out. But those kind of things made us close. Granted, it bonded us. And we all been in jail together on different struggles. And we all understood intuitively and uh, like Sharon said, intellectually, that we have to have mass third world unity if we're going to do anything about the nature of this uh, racist, capitalist America. And we're in the belly of the monster. We got to be unified. El Centro de la Raza, from its founding to the day, has always been the model and exemplar and example of what all of us have tried to follow. And lastly, some of these three cats, even though all of them are in heaven or somewhere now, uh, they call me sometime when I get to going astray and I hear their voices say, hey, you got to tighten your stuff up, bro. <laughs> you represent us. So oh, they'll always be the four me through me well, and sure and said them. through all of y'all and everybody younger than us. You did what I'm saying, Enrique? Yeah, their spirits are there. There's no doubt about it. Stella, you... Yeah, I just wanted to add, just in terms of um, just the importance of the multiracial unity. We built Plaza Maestas. You know, there's people of all races that live there. There's a beautiful art that is depicted throughout. But what came out of that and um, the confidence in communities of color, we had so many people coming from the Asian community, the African-American community, the Native American community wanting advice, you know, how, how did you build, you know, Plaza Maestas? What did it, what did it take? Yeah. And so, you know, obviously El Centro gave um, a lot of information on, on the steps that people should take. And, you know, and I'm proud to say that some of those people that came to us are starting to build housing. They have completed housing. And yeah. so the like work- Reverend Jeffrey. Yeah. Day, exactly, yeah. Reverend Jeffrey. Um, example of that today still happens in terms of El Centro giving back in, in whatever way we can. And in particular, I want to talk about the emerging um, African communities. Somehow they heard that El Centro was a place that could help you. And so I would have people from, you know, different sectors of the African community coming and asking and I remember how hard it was when El Centro was seen, you know, like, you know, we didn't have, not everybody loved us, even though a lot of people loved us and they saw us as socialists and communists and-, and Communists, mostly. Yeah, and we didn't have a lot of people that helped. And I knew, I mean, I remember how hard that was. And so when these emerging yeah. African communities come to us, we turn over our personnel policies, our financial policies, volunteer policies, internet policies, so that um, they don't have to work as hard um, as we had to. Um, and that, you know, that's our commitment also to help build other communities too. You know, right now we are facing uh, two pandemics and that is okay. a pandemic of COVID-19, the coronavirus, but also the pandemic of racism in this country. But, um, it, you know, th these are really hard times, no doubt about it. And Estella, what has the pandemics, in particular COVID, I guess, because of people have not been able to work or do what they need to do, how has uh, El Centro responded to that? You know, obviously we have had to, you know, shut shut down El Centro like so many other organizations and businesses and so forth. But as also as an essential organization, there are certain components of El Centro that remains open. And several of those is our early childhood development programs, our, our food bank, services to the elderly. Um, those programs are operating and, you know, we're providing services. Um, the rest of our staff are working remotely and are working, I mean, I would add that um, the work of El Centro has increased by 25% because of COVID. And so our people wow. are working very, very hard. And then the sad reality, and I think we all know that there, that there are so many people who are out of work and who need help with rental assistance and food and diapers and masks. And I mean, the list just goes on and on. And um, it's painful, you know, to see, to see, to see that. And then just how grateful 
you know, people are to whatever little help that we, we can provide them. And so that's, that's what El Centro has had, had to do in terms of providing these services remotely. And in fact, some of our, our programs, especially our workforce programs have become much more effective um, because uh, people can take the classes online. They don't have to worry about childcare because they're at home. And so those things are positive, um, but there's a lot of pain and suffering. People from other states are taking those, right? Some, yeah. you, you've got people from, from other states that are coming Yeah, we have people from Texas, oh. I think New Mexico, California, who are, for, for instance, taking our English as a second language classes. Right. Um, I received a question that I just want to bring out here today, uh, and, and that is uh, because it also reflects, I think, how, uh, you know, dealing with the visions. Um, but this is a question about that there was in the news today a call by uh, NAACP chapters for Seattle Public School superintendent to resign. On the other hand, I think, uh, Stella, you may have been a part of this where there is support for the superintendent. So now you have a bit of a clash between young and old. Uh, your thoughts on that? How, how do you balance these things in these days? I, I suppose those kind of differences are not unusual as you deal no, with them. No, they're not. They're yeah. not unusual, but in, in this case, I, I don't see it as a question of young and old because the individuals or organizations that are supporting the superintendent is a multiracial group of people yeah. um, in terms of, you know, um, people from the Asian community, you know, obviously a center from the Latino, but there is a long list of organizations that are supporting um, the superintendent. And, um, you know, the, I don't wanna go into all the details right. about what the differences are, um, but um, obviously that coalition has a different perspective than, than the others. Right. Um, I'd like to uh, just kind of wrap things up here. We, uh, we're at about, uh, oh, we were about a minute, or at one hour and 15 yeah, minutes. You got a whole minute. Our conversa our conversation. Um, uh, but I, I'd like you to each kind of give me just a little bit of a wrap up about, uh, about El Centro. And, and I think maybe uh, what it means, but also what your hope for the future is. Bruce, let me begin with you. Um, you know, El Centro is um, always in in my heart. You know, although I'm um, um, elsewhere, um, and and I th think that's true with um, other people too. And as I said earlier, I I think it's part of my uh, you know up bringing as a thinking, feeling person. And I'll, I'll leave it there. And I want to thank, you know, every, everyone here for, you know, helping to maintain it. And our spirits are with, you know, for Berto and Bob and and others who, who came before, and I hope that the book will be uh, helpful in in preserving some sense of those those times. Yeah, I think it will. That's for sure, uh, Larry. Yeah, I would like to use a quote uh, that Bruce and Estella uh, chose to put in the book from Roberto that I think is very relevant for these days and times uh, in closing out our program. And uh, the quote is, when asked about, well, when did your people come over here? And Roberto said, oh, no, 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 y'all got that wrong. I mean, that's my language, but I, I'm not that good <laughs> in Spanish. My family, this is what he says to him, though. My family did not cross the border, y'all. The border crossed us. Yeah. yeah. The Latino people in Mexico and Nevada and, 
Arizona and Texas was here way before 1776. A lot, it, Roberto family that came in the late 1500s, 1600s, other families 1700s. They've been living in New Mexico for 400 years, not just 100 years. And the reason that's relevant is today you hear Donald Trump talking about we're tired of those people coming over our borders. This is, this is way more relevant to be the Latinos country than your country. Your mother came over here in 1848 and your daddy's family in 1868. So what are you talking about? But El Centro teaches us to take these examples, tie them together. You know, Black people have been here 400 years and a lot of us still are told, if y'all don't like even President Trump and it's some of his El uh, talk about it. Well, if you, if you athletes and others don't like it, you go back to where you came from. What? We got here before the Mayflower homes. <laughs> so uh, the fact that uh, Roberto and all the other founders of El Centro saw from the get, we got to have a foundation, a center, if you will, that all of us can talk about how we redefine our current struggle and how to make it easier for us to work together and improve the conditions of all of our people together. Thank you. That's what I want people to take away from this program. And my wife over here is saying, right on, bro. <laughs> Sharon. Hey, Sharon. Oh. Sharon. Got to unmute. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I was just taken aback because I'm pretty sure Rhonda didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> So she's probably giving him the rap side. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> she says, Don't go there again. There you go. <laughs> so I think uh, what I hope um, we all will take away, not only from this evening, but from Bruce's book. And thank you, Bruce, for laboring so long with first right Roberto on. and then uh, for Estela and Miguel for yeah. picking up that legacy so that we could all um, hold on. Uh, to that history, because we all know if we don't know where where we come from, we won't know where we're going. And so that history is really our foundation, and right. um, it's important that we lift uh, the, the author up and uh, the um, the people who provided um, that grist uh, for the mill. But uh, I guess I really want to um, uh, express the hope that people walk away with uh, the notion that I think uh, Estella really sort of led us out with, which is this is about multi-racial coalition building right. for the beloved community. And when you think right. about that, and you break that all down, um, I have to say, and I, I, I just challenge all of you who have children and grandchildren um, and other beloved members of your family, because the beloved community is about family. <laughs> and I suspect that your family looks like my family. I know uh, Estella's grandchildren are Latino and uh, native. Um, uh, I know that uh, my uh, husband uh, was Indipino um, and his children uh, uh, have um, a lot of other mixtures in there. This is not just about, it is about an intellectual exercise and it's so important again that we not forget that that is such a core part of El Centro's mission and of those uh, activists uh, from the 60s and 70s. And that's what I would challenge our young people to really make sure that they, they have uh, a good grasp of. But um, it also is, this is about our future. We are becoming a multiracial society. We are already there. And if we cannot understand that, uh, then we are really only contributing to our own demise as a country and uh, as a community. Thank you. Mike. Mike Tilly. Well, I think thinking about tonight, just the overall picture, I just think about uh, perseverance. I, uh, you know, I think about the uh, kind of like the, uh, the way the state of our world is today. It's very, I think about a lot of the struggles and challenges and, 
the political kind of landscape is just makes gives me pause. I, I swear every single day I'm learning something that's very volatile and quite alarming. But I always think that, uh, you know, thinking about all the great work that, uh, you know, that the people in, in this company here uh, have done over the years, I think that too shall uh, overcome. I think just this keeping a strong belief in uh, what we're all doing, uh, showing the youth that it can be done. I think that's something that's quite valuable and it will, it will get brighter. I think this is, uh, you know, I, know, I do believe there are checks and balances that will uh, help us and prevent this, uh, what I consider a, a devolving of our society for the last four years. I do think that uh, uh, times will get better, uh, but there is always a you know, concern for the future uh, because there's always another cycle that will come that can be quite alarming again. But I do think that uh, one thing that I'm, I'm glad to see is that we are becoming more multicultural. And uh, as a matter of fact, the minority will be the majority uh, within about uh, within 29 years, so I'm very thankful that that will be uh, you know that will happen as such. Enrique Gonzalez. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I would be remiss to mention if I didn't mention that um, I'm also on the board for Mohai, which is the organization that is hosting this event tonight. Um, and you know, I'm I'm so honored and grateful to be here with you all. Um, and to also be a part of that organization that we're trying in this time to revitalize and change and adapt with the changing times and the conditions. And, you know, as Estela was talking about, this is a, a time where, ironically, we're getting better at some of the services that we're, we're able to provide. Um, but I, I want to mention that, um, you know, it's ironic, I think, as well, that one of the limiting factors is that we can't be in the same space physically with each other. And I think that one of the things that that has caused is the world to be viewed as much smaller than it really is. You know, we're so much more dependent on each other than we think. And, you know, we're having conversations with people all over the country um, that can be just next door or just, you know, on the other side of the country. So I think that, uh, you know, when I think of El Centro, for me, the building itself is, is a quintessential part of that experience. And yet, many of us can't access those types of things right now. And so what that means is that events like this and presence like this have to be carried into a new medium. And we have to find new ways to be able to pass those types of things down. And I think that this book that you all have made that Bruce, you did so much work on um, is an example of how, you know, when I received it, I, I got, I teared up um, because it felt like it was a message from Roberto himself. Um, many of the things that I read were many of the things that I remember hearing personally. So, you know, when I think about the future, I think about, you know, right now things are very difficult. And, and Michael, you mentioned cycles. Um, here we are again, you know, at a time where we have to innovate, we have to have courage and we have to find a way to do what's right. And I think that you all, when you stepped into the building and you took it for those yet, yet unborn, we're thinking about that and we have to also think about that now. So um, I'm just really glad that, that I'm able to, to call you all my mentors and my friends and, and, I, and I look forward to a time when we don't have to do this via computer, um, when we can go back to actually being in, in our presence. But in the meantime, we have to do what's right, which is you know mask up and, and do what we can to, to change the conditions. And hopefully in a month or so, we can be having a different conversation about somebody else taking the, the, the helm of things and, and things being very different. Um, so I'm just very glad and look forward and have a lot of hope. And receiving this book and looking at it and reading it gives me a lot of hope for things to come. One item, here's a, a picture that the, the artist uh, sent me, you know, Elf. Can you hold it up high there? So actually hold it up in front of your face there, Bruce. How's, how's oh. it? Oh, yeah, Alfredo Arguin and Roberto. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. I, I would say uh, like our early 90s or, or so. This is um, at our, our house for, for keeps. <laughs> <laughs> Estella, you get the last word. 
Yes, thank Almost you. Almost last word. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all, first of all, for being on the panel, um, Enrique and, and everyone. This has been great. Thank you so much for, you, for your time and, and effort to be. And I guess my last parting words would be uh, to people is that we're going we're gonna to get through COVID. Um, it may take a little longer um, than it should have. And yes, Enrique, we've got to mask up and tell everybody. But there's a beautiful quote um, by Jose Marti. Our early childhood development center is named after Jose Marti, who was a writer of children's books and also um, a revolutionary in the um, late 19th century, moving into the, into the 20th. And he said that in a what time country? of crisis, oh. in a time of crisis, the peoples of the world must rush to get to know each other. Yeah. And certainly we are in a crisis, not only with COVID and the economy, but also um, how are we going to save this planet? You know, we're, we haven't been talking enough about how we're going to save the planet because we've been distracted by um, the, the day in and day out um, antics of, of the Trump administration. So those, those are my parting words, is that we must rush to get to know each other and we can do that in a time of COVID also. Well, I wanna thank are, all of you very much. Whoop, am I interrupting you, Larry? I, I just wanted to tell Enrique Gonzalez to tell uh, Rachel and Nicole, particularly Rachel, how wonderful a job on behalf of Mohai they did it. Pull, organizing this and pulling it together and to thank uh, uh, Estella and, and uh, Bruce for the great job they did on this book and all of us to remember to use this as a foundation to continue the people's struggle onward because that's an absolute necessity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gossett. I appreciate that. And the book, here it is again. It's called Seattle's El Centro de la Raza. Dr. King's Living Laboratory, Bruce E. Johansson. Thank you, Bruce, so much for joining us from Omaha. And thank you for your hard work. Thank you all. Uh, I'm, I'm most pleased by the fact that I think this is the, I don't know, maybe the first time I've been on uh, a panel with another Enrique, and that's kind of nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's why I I'm also uh, want to, uh, all those folks who haven't done, make sure you get out and vote. Okay. And um, take care, everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to say, oh, right, Stella, go ahead. Oh, uh -huh. Yes, I want to say one thing about the book. The book is expensive. And if you call El Centro de la Raza, we were able to get a 40% discount on it. And if you want it, it's both in hardback and uh, paperback. And you'll get it from us at a much discounted price. Okay. Oh, from you. Yes. Where can we... Where can we buy the gang of four at El Centro? Well, <laughs> you are going to be doing research that. on that, Larry. I don't okay, know. I got it. I we'll got post it. those above. We'll uh, ask the, Rachel and Nicole to, all right. to get all that information <laughs> and post it on. Anyway, right. thank you all for joining thank us you. this evening. I really appreciate it. Right. And uh, one last thing for me, and that is that, you know, El Centro means a lot to me because uh, Roberto was someone that I, I really admired. But also, I, Larry, I've always admired you for everything you've done. Same thing with <laughs> Uncle Bob. I miss him and very much. And of course, I miss Bernie just because mm -hmm. Bernie was crazy and I just love being with him. So yeah. I, I just feel honored that I got to know those guys, be around them. And, you know, they, they, you know, they said they were going to do something. They, they would do it. And so yeah. for the young people of today, yeah. keep that in mind and look to them as mentors to the future. Rachel, I'll let you take it over. Good night. Well, thank you. Thank you, Enrique, for all the moderating. And thank you for Bruce and Estella and Larry and Sharon and Enrique and Mike for all being here. I just know I have learned so much and been so inspired by your words. And I'm just, my heart feels full. So thank you for all your words tonight. Um, and thank you to everyone out there. Although I cannot see you, I am so glad you are here listening in. Um, and joining us at this program. I just want to encourage you to come back next month for History Cafe, um, where we will be, uh, History Link will be putting it on, and it's going to be the Writings and Remembrances with Tamiko Numura. So please come back. It's going to be third Wednesday, which is November 18th, and it again will be at 6.30 here on Zoom. 
Uh, and then, as always, if you learn something new or enjoy the work we are doing during this unprecedented time in history, please consider making a gift or becoming a member to support future programs and help us sustain the museum beyond this unforeseen closure. And that is it. Thank you again to all the panelists and Enrique for being such a wonderful moderator. And everyone stay safe. And uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank good you. Night. Good night. <laughs>